Hello, good afternoon and welcome back to the Analyst of Vajit Ramin Ravi where we bring to you detailed discussion of important articles from Hindu and Indian Express. Today is 6th of January 2024 and before having a look into the articles, here's a gentle reminder that in order to quickly revise and test your knowledge regarding what you have learned in this session, you can refer to and you can try to solve the MCQs which are provided by the end of the video. So kindly participate in that. Now, let's have a glance into the important articles of the day. So the first topic is about the maritime piracy. This is also in news because of the rising militancy in the Red Sea. And also in news because recently Indian Marcos from Indian Navy have successfully put a positive end to the hijacking attempt in one among the vessels. In the second one, we will read about the Premier Financial Investigation Agency, that is Enforcement Directorate. And why are we reading this? Because ED officials have recently been attacked while they were searching a TMC leader's house. Then, as aware citizens of India and amid the ongoing election seasons, we will equip ourselves with the knowledge of EVMs, that is electronic voting machine and what are VVPAT, what is the functioning and what was their origin and background story. Then from prelims point of view, we will read about the growing disease menace of antimicrobial resistance. And finally, we will wind up the session by reading about and doing the policy analysis of the recently launched comprehensive scheme by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. This is the Prithvi Vigyan scheme. So let's start the discussion. So here our first topic is about the maritime piracy. And why are we reading this? Because recently Indian Navy has thwarted the hijacking attempt by the pirates in the Arabian Sea leading to successful evacuation of 21 crew members on board a merchant vessel whose name was Leela Norfolk. So this is how Indian Navy has been successful in catering with this hijacking attempt. But before understanding this news and maritime piracy, let's first understand what is going on in the maritime front. So, world is suffering enormously in its maritime front due to the rising of Red Sea militancy ever since the Israel and Hamas war has taken place. So, in the Red Sea, you will be able to see that a lot many vessels and ships have been frequently attacked and captured by the hijackers over there, by the pirates over there. And this is what creating a global concern not only for the maritime trade, but also for the maritime security. And you can see that in the last month only, in the December month only, Indian Navy has been called upon by multiple distressed ships and vessels, where you can see that a Malta flagged vessel Ruin on December 14 was calling for the help of Indian Navy because they, have, they were hijacked by the militants of the Red Sea. The Red Sea militants are basically the Yemen Houthis, Houthis rebels of Yemen region. And to learn more details about it, you can refer to the analyst of 20th December, where in the first topic only, we have, de we have dealt with Yemen Houthis uh, in great detail. So, we saw multiple instances. One has, been, um, uh, one has been attacked by the militants. In the second one, a vessel, Chem Pluto, had a projectile attacked on it. And then there was a drone attack on a Gabon flagged crude oil tanker as well. So therefore, there are rising concerns about the growing militancy and the growing hijacking or the piracy in the Red Sea region. Now, in this backdrop, we will understand what is maritime piracy. Maritime piracy actually is not a new thing. It has been there ever since 17th, 19th century. In fact, the very famous movie Pirates of Caribbean covers the backdrop, is worked on the backdrop where the very famous, the golden age of pirates from 17th to 19th century, especially in the Caribbean Sea is covered. So we know that piracy or the maritime uh, hijacking is not a new thing. But in today's world, it has become globally acknowledged and it has also become a huge weapon of terrorism. So therefore, UN clause... UN clause is an international agreement which uh, created a legal framework to deal with the law and order in the maritime zone. So UN clause which was established in the year 1982 defines in its article 101 that what is maritime piracy. So according to UN clause this is an act which involves violence, detention or depredation. Depredation stands for any kind of hazard or any attempt to destroy or damage either a life or a livelihood or a vessel. So these events, 
that are done for the private gains in the high seas. What stands for the high seas? Which seas which are open for all, does not belong to any particular jurisdiction. These are outside the exclusive economic zones. So these kind of violent activities, when they are conducted in the high seas for the private gains, they are termed as maritime piracy by the UN clause definition. Now they may include seizure of ships, the cargoes or the kidnapping of its passengers or crew. Now you must remember that the conventional form of piracy had its agenda in the war. That is to have wealth, adventure and rebellion. But in today's time it has got expanded because now they also want to pursue terrorism by uh, using the seas or using the high seas. So therefore it has become a very serious maritime crime. What are the different type of threats possessed? There are multiple threats, there are multidisciplinary in nature. First of all it causes physical harm to the crew member of the vessels and it causes physical harm by kidnapping them, asking for the ransom, even killing them, shooting them on the side. Then trade disruption takes place because the container, the delivery of the goods and services gets delayed and this also hampers the overall trade. This is more so important when it is concerned with the Red Sea which carries more than 30% of the total global trade. And then it also impacts the fishery industry because where will the fishermen go if their vessels are captured, it will impact their livelihood, their economies as well. And finally, it also have grave concerns related to the security of the coastal nations where this threat is being possessed. And also, it is an international security concern as well because this is being done in the high seas. Now, when we understand the threats, what are the red zones of pirate activity ever since ever since the inception of this new form of terrorism. So it has been, as you can see from the map, it has largely been in the Gulf of Guinea, as you can see here, also in the northwestern coast of Africa, then in the Somalia coast, in the Persian Gulf as well, in the Gulf of Aden, Red Sea, this zone is a red zone for, for pirate activities. And this is ever since when the Israel-Palestine war take place, so the conflict started taking place, this zone also became a red zone for it. Then the Southeast Asian nations and the related coastal waters are also vulnerable. Then the Caribbean islands. Caribbean islands have been historically known for the pirates. And we have Gulf of Aden, we have Indian Ocean, we have Indian subcontinent and we have Horn of Africa. Horn of Africa that is this region. Now, can you tell me the countries which are surrounding the Horn of Africa? Because this can be a good important question for prelims. So, what are the countries surrounding or bordering the Horn of Africa? Now, these are the some of the red zones for the pirate activity. Now, these pirate activities also need to be taken care of. They need to be, we need to be safeguarded against these new form of terrorism. So, for that, there are certain international initiatives and national initiatives. We need to learn both. So, when it comes to international initiatives, the first thing that we need is international co cooperation. So, why do we need international cooperation? Because when something is being done on a common platform like high sea, it is not only one stakeholder's responsibility, but responsibility of all the other countries as well to ensure the safety and the sanctity of the high seas. And therefore, we need international collaborations. And international collaboration was for the first time taken care of by the United Nations Convention on the Laws of Sea. This was initiated by this was initiated in the Montego Bay of Jamaica. Jamaica again is a country in the Caribbean island. So here in 1982, this legal framework was adopted in order to provide safeguards, law and order regarding the maritime security. So first of all, there is UN clause operative. And second, we need to ensure that multiple regional efforts which are led by different countries are also in place in order to take care of any immediate emergency. So, for example, there is this US-led multinational initiative to safeguard the seas, the Red Sea especially and the militancy that is going on there. This is the Operation Prosperity Garden. Not only US is active, but European Union is also active in the same region to safeguard the maritime security by Operation Atlanta. And also you can see multiple operations that are carried on by Indian Navy as well. So there are certain regional operations as well to take care of the immediate emergencies. Then there need to be proper safeguard to penalize the people who have been doing the piracy or who have been hijacking the vessels and the people. So for this there is convention for the suppression of unlawful acts against the safety of maritime navigation. This is signed in 1988. 
then there should be a combined force a combined force which is coming from multiple countries a multilateral kind of force having contribution from multiple nations and stakeholders to ensure the safeguarding of the maritime of the maritime region so this is the combined maritime forces this is a multinational naval uh, naval partnership where uh, the navy of multiple countries come together and they have deliberations and they have dedicated operations to safeguard the region then this requires efforts against terrorism piracy it also ensures fostering regional cooperation and overall promoting a secure maritime environment it has got 39 members in it india is one of the member of it so you need to remember it from prelims point of view and you can also use this information in your mains answers then what are the india's own initiatives so india has been very active ever since 2008 when it comes to gulf of aden so by the way what is gulf of aden gulf of aden is that gulf which connects two water bodies one is the red sea and second is the arabian sea and it is in the gulf of aden where this uh they, they, they these hijacking attempts have been seen so gulf of aden and the red sea so india has been very active in its anti piracy patrols and surveillance so it has installed multiple naval ships for example ins chennai as can seen in, as can be seen in this news and has also installed multiple aerial surveillance with the help of helicopters drone etc to have an all round surveillance of the areas which are disturbed and especially areas around the bay of bengal and arabian sea then we also have got comprehensive networks for information dissemination these are the coastal surveillance network this is patrolled by the indian coast guard you must also remember that the areas up to exclusive economic zones are patrolled both by indian navy and indian coast guards so for information dissemination among them there is coastal surveillance network installed in india there is a national command control communication and intelligence network and there is also a national project which is named after national maritime domain awareness project so these are some of the surveillance mechanisms adopted by india what are the institutional measures india has led to establishment and also participation in multiple institutions for example the indian ocean rim in initiative or association which was found in year 1997 so it is composed of 20 plus countries india being a part of it and uh, then we are also party to un clause we are also party to the regional maritime security initiative comprising of the regions of indian ocean uh, rim and then we have also established an international fusion center or information fusion center which is headquartered in gurgaon new delhi so therefore these are some of the cooperations and institutions established by india then what are the policy initiatives for maritime security we have got the sagar policy which ensures security and growth for all belonging to the indian ocean region the sagar policy also entails certain provision regarding the piracy attempts or the hijacking attempts in the maritime domain and we have also got a legal provision by the name of maritime anti piracy act of 2022 very very recently legalized it ensures that the people who are offending the laws and orders of the maritime security they are duly penalized so these are some of the safeguards that we need to take care of for both prelims and mains perspective because red sea militancy has been causing a lot of hijacking attempts in the maritime security now let's move on to the next topic of the day this is enforcement directorate and why are we reading because in a very unfortunate event the ed team which was supposed to be conducting a search in the residence of a tmc leader in west bengal has been attacked this team has been attacked by the supporters of this leader so therefore we'll be reading about enforcement directorate a very very important body for us to study so enforcement directorate as the name suggest is a premier agency which is responsible for enforcing the provisions and the laws of the constitution of india and specially the financial laws of the india so therefore it is named as enforcement directorate it is a directorate which is situated in the or office attached in the ministry of finance which takes care of the financial investigations and henceforth we call it as the premier financial investigation agency of the government of india which is also having multidisciplinary functions because it deals with multiple financial offenses regarding the offenses of foreign exchange laws or regarding the offenses that are done by money laundering so it covers and also like fugitive fugitive economic offenses so all of these are covered so all of these 
are covered by enforcement directorate therefore this is a multidisciplinary organization and therefore you will see involvement of ed lately in many of the cases that you are seeing in newspapers now let's talk about the structure of the enforcement directorate so enforcement directorate is headquartered in new delhi with multiple regional offices regional offices are there in mumbai chennai chandigarh kolkata and delhi you should also remember this from state pcs point of view who is heading the enforcement directorate there is this enforcement director then how is the how is the people and the director recruited into this agency it is done with the help of direct recruitment which means there is no particular or specialized examination conducted for this rather there is direct recruitment from other different investigation agencies for example cbi etc so here we take the officers of designation like ips irs ias directly and put them into the office of enforcement directorate then what is the tenure this is very very interesting so the tenure is 2 years typically but the chief's tenure or the director's tenure can be extended to up to 5 years by providing extension of 1 year at a time so the total of it will become a 5 year tenure and this was made by the amendment of dpsc and cvc now what are the functions this is the main thing so as i've already told you it performs multidisciplinary functions so first of all it deals with the cases or offenses related to the violation of the foreign exchange laws what provides is a statutory backing to do so this is the very important act coffee posa or the conservation of the foreign exchange and prevention of smuggling activities act of 1974 what it does essentially it enables the ed to sponsor the cases of preventive detention so ed will be given the power to detain to have preventive detention of the cases of the people who are contravening to the fema act or the foreign exchange management act of 1999 within this act only it gets the power to investigate adjudicate and also penalize the people who are accused of the offenses or who are convicted of the offenses but it not only deals with the jurisdiction of foreign exchange law violation but it also deals with money laundering so it also gets the power to trace the asset derived from the proceed of the crime or say money laundering it gets the power to provisionally attach the property as well it also gets the power to prosecute the offenders and eventually confiscate the property but it's not done by ed as such it is done by a special court confiscation of the property is done by a special court so these are the two functions but they are not the only functions it also deals with the jurisdiction regarding the fugitive economic offenders act for example vijay malya one among the fugitive economic offender the the right to attach his property in india to confiscate his property is given to ed and therefore ed is responsible for going after them now what are the issues related to enforcement directorate just like any other regulatory body it has also got some lacunas let's discuss them so the first one is because it it has got multidisciplinary functions across multiple statutes multiple acts therefore it is very vague it is very ambiguous as to how long and how far does its discretion go it has got huge discretion which eventually leads to misuse of power second it lacks the transparency on the selection of the cases it is generally seen that they target the opposition parties or those who have left the ruling party so therefore there is lack of transparency and there is also low conviction rate it was seen that in the year and from the decade of two in the decade of 2005 till 2013 it was seen that the total rate of conviction was 0% for ed and from 2013 to 2022 the conviction rate was only 23% so definitely it calls upon an alert to have more transparency and accountability matrix set for the ed so that we know that who are they who are they accusing of and who are they going after then the political partisanship ed also has been alleged to have a political bias towards those people it generally provides quicker clean sheets to the people who belong to the political parties or who have shifted their allegiance to the political party so therefore this also questions the legitimacy or the integrity of this financial premier body then we also need to suggest some of the reforms for the better strengthening of ed 
First reform is that we need to have more comprehensive investigations, more efficient investigations so that the resources are not drained unnecessarily and also the conviction rate if it is there should increase as well. So here we need to have enhanced coordination with other agencies like CBI, CVC, CIC etc in order to have more comprehensive investigation. Second, that we need to have more efficient data analytics for that we can rope up the technology for example big data analytics, the age of digitization will promote the same and then we need to have a robust whistleblower protection program so that the financial frauds can be revealed by whistleblowers without any fear or fright. This will help in the working and the better, uh, better conviction of the rates by the ED. Then ED needs to be having a clearer legal framework so that proper guidelines and rules are provided, proper jurisdiction is provided to ED so that there is no scope of unnecessary discretion, misuse of power. Then we need to increase the accountability and transparency of the ED itself because it needs to reveal on what basis they are, they are considering a particular case and rejecting or ignoring the other cases. They need to put their records, they need to put their data on notifications for public to see. And finally, we need to ensure that there is lessening of the political bias by also ensuring that there is less political interference in the working of enforcement directorate. This will ensure that the public will build trust on the enforcement directorate and will help in the functioning, will not cause obstruction in their functioning. So this was about enforcement directorate. Now moving on to the third topic, this is electronic voting machines and VV pads. Now amid the election season, we are reading about this because the opposition leader, Jairam Ramesh, has raised concerns on the integrity and on the security of the VV pads and the election and the electronic voting machines. So Election Commission though has dismissed the concerns regarding this. We as UPSC aspirants will take up the topic and read what is the evolution, what is the background story and how does these two mechanisms work in order to ensure free and fair election in world's largest democracy. Now to begin with the electronic voting machine EVMs. So EVMs are actually recent occurrences. They have only occurred after 1970s. Before that, when India saw the independence, we used to vote using the ballot papers. So what used to happen that we were getting ballot paper with symbols of different parties and we used to mark a cross against the person who we want to choose as our representative and then we used to put it in the ballot box and this used to be law. But there were definitely concerns regarding the security of the ballot box because at that time hijacking the ballot box, having a lot of invalid votes, this was a common phenomena. To take care of this and to establish more efficient voting mechanisms, the Election Commission of India in 1977 mooted the idea of moving to electronic mode. This was more so needed because the technology advancement was taking place. Multiple countries, democracies were efficiently organizing EVM conducted votes so or EVM conducted election. So therefore, in order to overcome the ballot paper challenges, for example, the invalid votes, the hijacking of the ballots or the tampering of the ballots, all of this, and also by taking the advantage of the recent coming technology, Election Commission decided to move to electronic mode, from physical mode to electronic mode. This ensured that the election process could be free from ambiguity and you can verify it. Now the voter can verify who are they voting and the voters are putting those votes which are being counted as valid votes. So now the problem of invalid votes would also be decreased. So taking that idea up, M.B. Hanifa for the first time invented an electronic voting machine in, eight, in 1980 and to have a test trial of the same, it was first used in the election of Kerala in a by-election of the North Paravur Assembly Constituency of Kerala. This is in the year 1981, immediately after its invention. Now, seeing the efficiency, as you know that, this, that the 61st Constitutional Amendment Act of 1988 did a very huge electoral reform where it shifted the age from 22 to 18, from 21 to 18. And it also did another thing that it amended the section 61A of the Representation of People Act that is responsible for governing the election conduct of India. So it also inserted this section empowering the commission to use the voting machines in the assembly election. 
अगेन इट वॉज कमीशन ऑफिशियली बाई द इलेक्शन कमीशन ऑफ इंडिया अलॉन्ग विथ भारत इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स लिमिटेड एंड द इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स कॉर्पोरेशन ऑफ इंडिया लिमिटेड दीज आर द टू प्रेमियर एजेंसी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर फेसिलिटेटिंग इलेक्ट्रॉनिक डिवाइसिस फॉर द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया सो इट वॉज कमीशन इन नाइनटीन एटी नाइन बाई दीज थ्री बॉडीज एंड फाइनली फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम इन अ लार्ज स्केल इन अ स्टेट स्केल In 1988, an assembly election was conducted in MP Rajasthan and Delhi using the EVMs. When was the time when the Lok Sabha formally involved EVM in its in its election process? So, for the first time, Lok Sabha general elections using EVMs was conducted in the year 2004. So, this was the history, evolution, and background of electronic voting machine. Now, how does an EVM work? You must know this. as an aware citizen of india not just being a upsc aspirant see electronic voting machines these are the e machines which enable the voter now to click on the button rather than filling on a ballot paper and putting it in a manual box so now we'll be able to click the button for the choice of or against the choice of our candidate now we'll be getting this particular the infrastructure of evm has got two units first unit is put in the voting compartment where you and i will go and put our votes in the voting compartment there will be a balloting unit this is a balloting unit and balloting unit right now has got the evm machine and has also got vv pad attached with it and the second unit is the control unit which is with the polling officer or the presiding officer appointed by the election commission of india for that particular poll so here the control unit will be established so there are essentially two units both of them are both of them are attached or connected using a 5 meter long cable and this is the entire infrastructure that you need to set up an evm evms are driven by battery that to a very very mild battery of 6 volt only Uh, with which we control the control unit so therefore it can also be effectively used in those regions where electricity supply is not possible for example the remote areas andaman nicobar tribal areas etc everywhere evms are effective because they are not dependent on electricity they are battery driven so we have understood evm now evm had got certain challenges as well because electronic voting machine uh, was also it also had some concerns of the political parties had concerns that evm could be tampered or there is no verifiability mechanism whether the person who has entered a particular vote has given the same vote or not or has reflected the same vote on the control unit or not in order to ensure verifiability in order to again reduce the problem of ambiguity another component was added to the infrastructure of evm this was the vv pat vv pat stands for voter verifiable paper audit tray it helps the voter basically to physically confirm the choice that they have made therefore voter will be able to immediately verify to whom they have voted and immediately detecting any kind of malified uh, or malfunctioning that must or tampering that must have been hap uh, happened in the electronic voting machine so this is a very quick verifiable method where an audit trail a paper trail goes and then it uh, it stays there for about 9 seconds and then it then it goes down so we'll be able to verify it it is only for verify and also for the uh, for tallying by the election commission of india later on if any issue occurs so this idea was first proposed by eci in 2010 upon the request of multiple political parties in order to ensure the verifiability mechanism the accountability mechanisms of evm voting so vv pad was first used in an election in india in 2013 in nagaland so as you have seen evm was first for the first time used in kerala vv pad is used in nagaland and vv pad and evms were together used in large scale in the same year in mizoram legislative assembly and in the general lok sabha elections it was in the year 2019 when vv pat was established at the national level now how does a typical vv pat works so first of all vv pat slip will be displayed as soon as you click on the button and it will remain there for 7 seconds sorry it was not 9 it was 7 seconds and then the slip would contain the three features and this question can be asked what are these three features first of all the candidate serial number the symbol of the candidate and the name of the candidate only these three things will be entailed in the vv pad and it will be available for you for only 7 seconds you cannot carry it back home then the counting of the slips in order to have a good tally so a counting of slip is also done by the election commission of india by the end of the closing of ballot so initially only one polling stations vv pad 
were counted or were tallied out of one assembly constituency per assembly constituency but now upon multiple uh, requests by the political parties and also by the supreme court judgment of 2019 five percent of the total assembly seats and their respective polling stations will be counted now there is also an ongoing demand that there should be 100% count of the VV pad slip but election commission of india believes that this is going to be a very tedious process and it will unnecessarily drain the manpower so anyway this is about evms electronic voting machines and the voter verifiable paper audit trail so i hope this is clear to you and none of the question will go wrong after now now from the prelims point of view we will be covering amr that is anti microbial resistance what is the news that a recent survey that was conducted by NCDC, the National Center for Disease Control, which is under the Ministry of Health, it in its report, first multicentric point prevalence survey of antibiotic use in the multiple sites of India of this year, this particular survey, named as such, released by NCDC, has thrown up startling statistics on the antibiotic overuse and misuse in India and the related diseases. This disease is known as antimicrobial resistance. Now, in order to quickly understand antimicrobial resistance, listen up this story. Ramu, Ramu was very fond of eating ice creams, used to eat ice creams, used to violate the laws of temperature every now and then. So, Ramu got infected by some viral disease. Now, upon having that, he went to the doctor. Doctor prescribed him a Schedule H drug. Schedule H drug that has a red line in it. Schedule H drug was prescribed. Say, azithromycin was prescribed. This was an antibiotic. And he was given to follow the dose for five days. Ramu went home. Ramu, upon having the antibiotic, saw that this is his infection. His bacterial viral infection is suppressing. So, why the infection was suppressing? Because some the moment antibiotic, antibiotics essentially is there to kill the biomes or to kill the, uh, the disease causing bacterias or the viruses or the fungi or the parasites inside the body. So, the antibiotic started acting up, killing the microbes inside. But Ramu, he was, he was so proactive towards eating ice cream. He had only two day dose and then he left the prescription and he went on to eating ice cream. He went on with his daily routine. Now what happens? In his gut, where the bacteria are living, here is where the microbes were getting killed by the antibiotics. But the moment he stopped taking the dose of antibiotic, the, the moment he violated the prescribed dose, some of the, some of the microbes, say for example bacteria, they rejuvenated themselves. They somehow tried to live with the environment of uh, of uh, antibiotics and therefore they built a resilience against these antibiotics for example azithromycin and now they will get converted into much stronger superbugs they will become so strong that they will not be killed by this particular antibiotic anymore so the next time when the ramu will be having viral infection he will not be or he will not respond his body will not respond well against this readily available antibiotic because he has generated antimicrobial resistance in him this is what we this is what we understand by antimicrobial resistance so this is essentially resistance acquired by any microorganisms let it be the disease causing virus or the bacteria or the parasites or the fungi inside the body against any kind of microbial antimicrobial drug because of the misuse or the overuse of the drug and therefore the body's response against the infection has also gone down has dampened Therefore, it compromises with the immunity. This becomes more so chronic when it is against the chronic diseases. For example, tuberculosis, for example, chol cholera, for example, malaria, for example, pneumonia. All of these life-threatening diseases also become incurable if you become antimicrobial resistance against them. Now, why is this happening? Because the virus or the bacteria, they learn to grow, they learn to rejuvenate, learn to protect themselves. So evolution happens in them with, in the form of mutation. So when you take the abuse or when you abuse the dose of antibiotics, they generally adapt. The, the permanent killing does not take place and therefore they generally adapt to the environment and then they mutate themselves to become antimicrobial resistance and therefore it becomes life-threatening so much so that World Health Organization has named it as the top 10 threat on the life of the people globally. It can also be highlighted from the fact that it is directly responsible for currently about 5 million deaths that are happening globally and it has been predicted by WHO that by 2050, 
this death rate will be up to 10 million. So therefore, we need to deal with this havoc of antimicrobial resistance where a medicine itself has become a poison for the body. Now, what are the different types of antimicrobial resistance? So antimicrobial resistance, first of all, is resistance to a particular drug or drug of the first line of defense. First line of defense drugs are those which are inexpensive, more readily available to you and more frequently prescribed by the doctor. And they are also less harmful for other cells of the body. So you can get upon abuse of that, you can get, you might develop drug resistance. Drug resistance for only one type of the medicine, any one. So the other would be effective for you. But once your body stops responding to almost all kind of first line of drugs or at least one kind of first line of drug, then you are set to develop multi-drug resistance TB, which means you are drug resistant not just to one type of medicine but also another as well. Now, the worst form is a rare form of multi-drug resistance which is known as extensive drug resistance. Let's take example of TB for example. TB disease has got the first line defense in Nio, in isoniazide and rifampicin medicines. Now, when the body becomes prone or resistance, or is it resist? Now, when the body becomes resistant to these two medicines, then it is said to have developed multi drug resistant TB. But if it has become resistant to not just the first line of defense, but also the second line of defense, which is more expensive, that is the amikacin or the kinamycin kind of medicines, along with the first line of medicine, then you are said to develop a very, very rare life-threatening disease. This is, the, this is the extensive drug resistance disease or say TB in this case. So these are the multiple types of antimicrobial resistance growing in this particular order. Therefore, you need to remember one thing that we need to aware we need to be aware of the overuse and the misuse of the antibiotics. It has been flagged by this particular report as well that in all the tertiary care hospitals, 70% of the people were prescribed of anti antibiotics. 55% of them were prescribed only for prevention, not only for the cure, not for the curative purposes, just for the preventive purpose. And the other 6%, only less than 6% were given medicines according to their particular disease issues. So this is the growing havoc of the overuse and the abuse of antibiotics. We as the patient or we as a citizen should also, be, should also ensure that whichever the red line campaign needs to be followed, which is promoted by the government of India. So here is where all the medications that have red line in them, they are considered as the Schedule H drug and they should only be taken upon the prescription of the, of the doctor and this should be their dose should be followed as prescribed by the doctor to end to end so as to completely do away with the microbes that are taking place inside the body which are causing disease. So therefore international attention is required and global efforts are required against antimicrobial resistance so that we ensure that medicine that are providing or supporting the life do not threaten the same. Then in the last topic, we will conclude by reading about this all-encompassing scheme recently launched by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. This is the Prithvi Vigyan scheme. So as the name suggests, it talks about studying or observing the Earth, Prithvi or Earth or the Earth Sciences. Now Earth essentially is a system which comprises of multiple components. It involves the geosphere, it involves atmosphere, it involves hydrosphere, it involves cryosphere, it involves biosphere. And the best part is that all of them are complicatedly or have complex interactions with one or the another. For example, if you talk about climate change, you cannot have one dedicated agency which is just reading about the atmosphere where the climate change is persisting because climate change has bearing also on the hydrosphere in the form of sea level rise, in the form of melting of ice in the cryosphere, in the geosphere as well in the form of desertification therefore and also decline of biodiversity so on the biosphere as well. So therefore because of the turning nature of the climatic events and the growing hazards, now we need to read or study earth as an entire comprehensive system rather than different systems or isolated systems. Now, in order to facilitate an integration of multiple systems and have a proper comprehensive study of the same, Ministry of Earth Sciences has launched an all-encompassing initiative known as Prithvi Vigyan Scheme to improve the understanding of the Earth system and 
to translate these learnings and these studies into or to translate the science into service. This is the agenda of the Ministry of Earth Sciences. This is going to be a five year long project where the five kind of schemes which were essentially previously taken up by the Ministry of Earth Sciences, all of them have been combined together. These are the ACROSS scheme, OSMART, PACER, SAGE, REACH OUT. The acronyms are very important because they can be asked in the prelims and you will be made to identify what they belong to. So the ACROSS was related to atmosphere research, then ocean services were researched using OSMART scheme, PACER scheme researched the cryosphere and geosphere was researched by seismology scheme and the overall research and development was taken care of, taken care by reach out. There were multiple schemes and now in line to have one nation, one earth sciences scheme. Uh, the Modi government has produced Prithvi Vigyan scheme for a five year span with a cost outlay of about 4000 crore rupees which will promote the R&D in the earth sciences field in order to understand multiple hazards, in order to understand the climate change events that are going on, what are their effects and what can be the applications so that they can be brought to the service of mankind. So let's quickly have an overview of their major objective. First of all is to have long term observation of multiple components of the atmosphere and to have augmented data of them. Then to record the vital signs and changes in the earth system, especially in those areas which have been largely unexplored. For example, the deep seas, the cryospheres, etc. Samudrayan mission is one step in the right direction, for example. Then to develop modeling systems for understanding it better and for having better predictions regarding disasters or other weather events. Then exploring the unexplored areas like the high seas, the polar regions. Then most importantly, developing technological implications or applications for the exploration and sustainability or sustainable harnessing of the economic resources. For example, from polar seas, we can have krills, we can have tunas, then from the deep seas, we can have polymetallic nodules. So we can have exploitation of these economic resources in a sustainable manner by developing technology by the, of the same using the Prithvi Vigyan scheme. It also entails the translation of science into service. And this you can use as a tagline in your essays as well, in your means answer writing as well. It will give a good impact on the examiner. So anyway, this is about uh, the five topics that we were to discuss. Then uh, now I will call upon you to answer the following MCQs that are presented before you. And on that note, I'll end the session. Thank you so much and have a nice day.